It's my pleasure to welcome you to the next Care Activist in Residence series. My name is Mohan Dara and I'm the director of uh, the Center for Culture-Centered Approach to Research and Evaluation at Massey University. This uh, year, we started a series called Decolonizing Anti-Racist Interventions. This was before Christchurch, but it was within the broader global context of Trump, uh, uh, what's going on in UK and what's going on more broadly globally with the legitimacy of whiteness and white supremacy that flows not only from extreme white supremacist spaces, but that is legitimized in the form of everyday politics, all the way from right-wing white supremacist politicians to politicians like Don Brash who think that they have the freedom to express white supremacy. So within that context then, we ask that question, what does it mean to dismantle white supremacy? And within that context, we further engage with that question, what does it mean for communities of color across the globe and locally to find anchors to dismantling white supremacy? Within this context, uh, Tiano's talk, Deconstructing Borders, Indigenizing Solidarity, is a really relevant anchor to our conversations. Our activist in residence, uh, Tiano Tuino, is of Naitakoto, Naipuhi, and Atiu origin. Tiano brings to us today his experiences working with indigenous activism, uh, labor activism, environmental activism. Throughout these experiences, one thing that seems to be common in Tiano's conversations is this ability to bring uh, talks and various ways of looking at the world across differences. So what I'm hoping that we learn from you, Tiano, today is the ways for bridging and connecting struggles and finding ways of anchoring these struggles in connections of solidarity. Welcome, Tiano. Uh, um, kia ora, hi everybody, my name is Tiana Tuiono. I wanted to acknowledge the, the mana whenua, my brother here, Warren, also some of the other rangitanis in the, uh, in the audience as well. Uh, I need to do that because my wife is from rangitani, she always appreciates that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, what, I, what I wanted to do was first of all just to talk a little bit about um, my experience and some of the ideas and why I came to those sorts of ideas. And um, I guess starting off with a uh, bit of clarity, I'm, I'm not an academic, surprise. Um, I, I've got a couple of degrees, I've got about 20 or 30 years ago, a law degree, and then I've got another degree which is full of a lot of miscellaneous stuff that when you're 18 years old and you go, well, that looks interesting. So I've got two, two of those degrees, but those are about 20 to 30 years old. So in terms of academia, I am my own research project, uh, sample size one. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, my family, a little bit about the history, of my, the history of my activism, and then how that shaped some of the conversations that I had in terms of engaging and talking about the nature of solidarity between POC communities, Tangata Whenua communities, refugee communities, and migrant communities. Probably ramble for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll get into some questions. Uh, so these are my parents. Um, my father uh, migrated here from the Pacific Islands. Uh, my mother's a, my mother's a, oh, go back. My mother's a Ngāpui from up north. Um, she's also from Waitakoto as well. Um, they had a very traditional South Auckland marriage. Uh, my dad was a bouncer at a pub, and my mum had no idea, and she was trying to get in. <laughs> um, and so uh, they they met on uh, they met on the doorstep of a pub in South Auckland. Um, I was born in West Auckland and then raised in South Auckland, so the best of both worlds. <laughs> um, I did get to spend a little bit of time in the islands. That's me on the far right. 
I'm smiling because it's warm, I'm on a tropical island, and I don't realise that climate change and biodiversity loss is going to destroy the planet. So, um, I, I centre a lot of the a lot of the things I do in terms of being, on one hand, a, a migrant from the Pacific Islands, but also Tangata Whenua is here, uh, Tangata Whenua here in Aotearoa. So on one hand, I'm a first generation Pacific Islander, and on the other hand, I'm Tangata Whenua. Can't count the number of generations we've been here, but ages as well. Um, and so a lot of my, um, a lot of the way that I see the world is grounded from those two perspectives. And I was brought up biculturally in the Pacific Island community in South Auckland, but also within my Māori community as well. I went to school to meet Pākehā people. It was, <laughs> it was great to meet you. <laughs> um, and so often when we talk about um, colonisation, uh, for me one of the first things that comes to mind is uh, it's all about the establishment of different states. So there's lines and borders they cut across. So things that were there before no longer are, are separated, from, separated and there are borders that you must cross and and stuff like that. So that's a, that's a picture of the Pacific as we know it geographically. There's the Cook Islands, we're a nice little square there. Um, uh, French Polynesia is right next door. Um, my, my grandfather actually, when he was young, about 14 years old, he worked in, in, in French Polynesia. The borders were there, but they weren't as strong as they are now. Um, and so there was very strong connections and flow of people between the Cook Islands and French Polynesia. He worked on a phosphate mining island in the Makatea. Um, so those, those borders have become stronger and harder to cross now. And uh, the fortunate thing is if you're from the place like the Cook Islands or Niue or Tokelau, those sorts of things, we get New Zealand passports, but one border up if you're on Kiribati or in Tuvalu, you've got to line up to get into New Zealand. So the history of those, the history of those lines and borders across the, uh, across the Pacific is also the history of colonisation in the Pacific. Um, often when I'm talking with Māori whānau, they always say to me, bro, you've got to take a Māori worldview. And I say, well, what do you mean what Māori worldview? What do you mean by that geographically? Is it just the North Island and the South Island? Is it North Island, South Island, and maybe the Chatham Islands as well? Um, for me, um, when, I was a young, when I was a kid growing up in the Cook Islands, I remember going to school once and um, this um, kid saying to me, oh, there's no Māoris in New Zealand, it's full of white people. And I was like, bro, my mums are Māori, and have you seen the haka? He was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah. No white person did the haka. That was definitely Māoris. So it was, in, in the Cook Islands, we are known as Cook Island Māori, but, and there was also New Zealand Māoris here, but the understanding that these two peoples were related was not something we learned about when we were little children. Easy to do now because of the internet and so on and so forth. But, um, but I wanted to show this picture. It's a, it's a feke. It's kind of designed for, for, for children, and it shows all the different linkages between all the different islands. So you have uh, Raiate in the, in the middle, and from Raiate people kind of descended down to Aotearoa, also down to Rekohu, also known as Whare in the Chatham Islands. Um, Rapa Nui, which is also known as Easter Island. Tonga, right up to the top to Hawaii. Um, but the thing here I wanted to highlight was though that, that entire whakapapa just pushes up and against and across borders. It doesn't care where the lines are. And so um, often when I'm, often, always, when I'm taking a, talking about um, building solidarity and building connections, um, I say to folks, well, if we're going to talk about the borders and, uh, borders and divisions that disconnect people from, from each other, in order for us to step back and to push back against that, we should take a whakapapa-based approach which pushes against those borders and asks ourselves how are we actually connected with each other? What is our whakapapa to each other? Um, and not only that, but also the whakapapa of struggle and the whakapapa of, uh, whakapapa of all the different linkages that people have. Um, I'm very mindful of that because um, I also know now that, that uh, you know, Pacific peoples have always been a voyaging people as well. And so, and so in, and back in the day when we used to travel around a lot, we didn't have these borders and stuff like that. But now we have, you know, folks coming over here from Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands working on fruit, uh, fruit picking farms, working for less than the minimum wage and so on and so forth. So for me that flies in the face of those, uh, those um, Pacific traditions of connection and whakapapa. So um, what does all that mean? Well that means for me that uh, when we talk about 
Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about this picture. Um, I went to university in, at um, Auckland, and this is the, the uh, picture of the marae waipapa, it's a very beautiful marae. Um, and one of the things that really struck me there as someone of Māori and Pacific Island descent is um, when I was thinking about what it means to have take a Māori worldview, is that around each, each all of those walls is different tipuna, so you have hotūroa, tamati kapu is on there, all of them all around there. But one of the things I noticed was that none of them were born in Aotearoa, New Zealand, they were all born in the islands. And so when I talk to many Māori communities, I, I say to them, when we, when we take a Māori worldview, we have to push back against the, uh, the, the nation state. We have to look beyond the border. And we have to understand why the, border, why the border is there and why we should reach out and connect with other people. So, um, oh, a little bit of activism. Uh, I've been involved in activism for about 20 years. Um, my grandfather was an old school um, trade unionist. So he always said that no matter where you, he, wherever he lived, he organised. So I sort of take, uh, that's a lesson that I've learned. So wherever I, wherever I live, I tend to organise. So folks promised the North Wanomi with organising with Peace Action in Manawatu, pushing back against the Weapons Expo that was here last year. And I acknowledge some of the people in the audience that were here organising with that. Um, also being involved in TPPA protests and campaigning for Māori wards and those sorts of things. So for me, it's like, I'm following in the lessons of my, of my grandfather by making sure the things that I do when I organise overseas are also the things that I do in my community. Um, that's in Paris. I was one of the folks organising at the Paris Climate Summit. Um, I got a background in uh, Indigenous people's rights and environment. So I was based in Paris working at UNESCO, organising on different Indigenous people's projects as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've worked in pretty much every corner of the planet, except for Antarctica, but if you've got a, got a space for me on your boat, I'll be keen to go down and check it out. Um, worked in a couple of remote rainforests, and one of the things I could tell you there is always take the malaria tablets, because uh, you might get bitten by lots of mosquitoes and go into a coma, so um, something, to, something to learn there as well. So anyway... Um, when I was talking with Mohan about um, the types of things that we wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to really, you know, take that framework of, that I've grown into as an activist and as an organiser and all that kind of thing and think about um, what, is it, what is it that can build, and build connections between different communities? What are the connections that we can make as tangata whenua, as pasifika, as refugee communities, as migrant communities? So I've been going around talking to a whole lot of different folks. Uh, I only had Richard with me for one day, so we got a couple of videos um, talking with, um, talking with uh, some uh, different community organisers as well. And I really wanted to look and investigate that space between um, POC, uh, POC communities, so people of colour. And, um, and I guess the reason that I wanted to, to work in that space is often when we talk about racism and white supremacy and all these sorts of things, uh, it tends to focus often on the white people in the room. So I wanted to find, well, what are the different examples that, that there are out there where that, that, that the centering whiteness and centering white fragility and all that kind of stuff is removed and people are actually building genuine, genuine com uh, connections with each other. Um, yeah. Oh, video. So I did a couple of videos. I wanted to do more, but you know, life gets in the way. Um, but I just got a couple of snippets here, just to sort of talk, give you a flavour of the types of things we were talking about. We took the monkey mob, and they came, and I was the first Friday prayer after the attack, so it was one week after. Um, and I worked from my workplace to the mosque, if that was easiest, and. I was crossing the city of Bridge and Hamilton and these guys come driving past to go to the mosque because they were already announced they were coming. Um, and so they had to turn away and I got the bikes and the cars and they were like, and I'm like, yeah, oh my God, oh! And then we had our Friday prayers and then we come out and these guys with a, a haka. 
And it was like incredibly powerful. And then there was pipe across the road, and the Lord was there, and I was like, oh, can I take a photo with you? And, can I? and this side just like was treated with so much love and respect. And I thought, wow, that's, that's something that possibly they don't get a lot of when they go around. And I know they do some of these sort of things, some of these guys are pretty terrible, but if, if they could come to our community and offer solidarity like that, and our community could accept that, you know, that, that's inspirational to me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, just recently we had a uh, anti-racism holy matter like that, um, and we had basically everyone there was uh, people of colour, you know, we had Māori, we had Asian communities, we had migrants, we had refugees, all of us collectively coming together kind of identify solutions and if you can dismantle racism, that is what solidarity looks like to me. Uh, yeah, so... Um the different types of conversations I wanted to have was, first of all, one thing. One of the things that happens in the media is we always talk about how shit everything is. So when I sat down and talked to people, I said, well, what are some of the inspiration? What are, what are, the, what are the moments of solidarity um, that happen between, uh, in your experiences with other, with other folks? And these were some of the examples that they, that they came up with. Um, things, that really, things that really resonated um, is that is that, um, for example, with what happened, the tragic events on, on, on March 15th, um, what surprised me, a lot of Māori folks as well, and, and a lot of POC communities, was the way that the white supremacist terrorists could just basically hide in plain sight. That was a theme whenever I was talking with folks, that that would come out. And um, how, how many of these different communities, Muslim communities and Māori communities, are routinely surveillance by the state as well. And so we, how do we build connections to keep each other safe, but also how do we learn those experiences and share those experiences to make our communities mutually stronger? So uh, I, I'll just touch on a couple of other moments of solidarity. I was fortunate enough to go up to Ihu Matau last week or two weeks ago. Um, and the, the different types of solidarity that were, were coming on to the Fenua were, were truly beautiful. Um, so there was this group here who came in. They were also there, I think, for Sunday Karaki as well, Muslims, um, Muslims standing with Ehu Mato, because um, they knew that when the tragic events in Christchurch happened as well, that Māori were opening up their marae and going down and showing solidarity. And so what for me that says is that, um, and in some of the interviews that we had as well, that uh, when white supremacy happens, it actually moves from different communities. So Māori are fully aware of that as well, and of course, with what happened in Christchurch, Muslims are also aware of that as well. So for them to reach out and show solidarity in Iu Mātou was, uh, was also a, a beautiful thing as well. Oh, got mine, okay. Um, yeah, that actually made the news though. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a rōpū that has been <coughs> Um, active in showing solidarity at Ihu Mātau as well. They've been translating a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the messages of the protectors and putting it out into different Asian languages. Um, uh, often because uh, when you migrate to this country, you try to fit in, you try to find those gaps to fit in, and you take on the mainstream perspectives often of yourself, but also of other communities. And so for those of us who are one and a half generations or two and a half generations into being New Zealanders and being from here, it's in kind of incumbent upon us to turn back and help to uh, support, our, support our communities as to why the narratives of why Māoris are like this or Muslims are like that or migrants are like this or that or the other are not, uh, not the progressive narratives that we should be pushing. And so these people have been up at Ihu Mātou and, and showing, solid, um, showing solidarity in that way. Uh, video time. Um, yeah, so another one of the, oh, that's an angry looking photo of him. Um, another one of the uh, issues that have come up uh, when we were talking, when I was talking with folks was, um, is that particularly now with the rise of Trump and, and and uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil and all these kind of right-wing right -wing nationalists that uh, 
othering is starting to become very, very intensified. And so as capitalism becomes in crisis and people get poorer and poorer, uh, power and hegemony encourages people to see people as incredibly different. They call this othering. And so um, one of the discussions I had with Gael, he articulated that very well. A lot of migrants, including my family, and I was brought up on stories about how our family resisted uh, imperialism, colonialism. Um, so that's that's certainly part of our, our heritage. Uh, so obviously, you know, when, when when migrants come here, when I come here, and I'm seeing it happening again in a different place. Uh, I have a natural sort of affinity to respect, but uh, in a more like practical way. Um, you know, we're constantly, we're in, in a society that benefits from white supremacy and racism. The New Zealand society, the capitalist state that exists here, was necessarily built on the, the ruins of that previous society that was, you know, um, disenfranchised and destroyed in every way could have been, right? Wasn't completely, but, you know, that, that was the project, right? So if I'm here and I'm a migrant and I'm facing discrimination and racism, you know, I can't ask for my equality to be sprinkled on top of this, you know, racist um, sort of like structure, you know, the structures of white supremacy and, and racism that run deep in this family needs to be weeded out before we can actually build something better. I don't know, I don't know why it paused like that. Um, and so one of the other conversations that I had, had with Gail and with a, a number of others is um, when racism intensifies, it's when there is also a lot of inequality happening, um, a, a lot of inequality happening. So often when we talk to, in particular, um, uh, uh, working class Pākehā people and they don't like immigrants or they don't like refugees and there's this whole... Hate, um, hateful rhetoric about immigrants coming over here and taking our jobs, and then you show them facts and figures like this. And this is a this is a really great graph because done I think last year, um, which pointed that 1.1.3 billion dollars went to two of the richest people in in the country, while 1.3 billion dollars, uh, while well the well the poorest half of New Zealand lost 1.3 billion dollars. So. It doesn't take a mathematical genius to point out where the money went. Um, and, and so one of the problems when we struggle and deal with white supremacy and white privilege and all of these types of things is to get working class people to recognise that actually, actually the, when, when neoliberalism kicks up, the, the wealth does not trickle down to the, down to the working people. And uh, yeah, so Gael talks a little bit about that here. Oh, no, you don't. Sorry, wrong one. Oh, and so this, this little step in here is uh, a little bit about, um, a little bit about how that othering happens. And um, yeah, Anjum talks about it quite well. taking place, but this extreme element of far-right um, thinking didn't get much traction here. Like, they were here, and they were doing their thing, but everyone kind of ignored them and laughed at them, 
and didn't take them seriously for a long time, but over the last five years, I think it's been a mistake to treat them like that. Uh, the world was changing and we could see that. Uh, we could see the impact on social media and the way that uh, marginalised people were attacked and silenced on social media and the targeted approach that they had towards pushing out their rhetoric and the use of free speech arguments to push out even more increasingly hateful messages um, was really a concern. But then we could see also overseas the kind of violence and killings and mass killings that were happening um, in the US and Canada and other places, um, death of an MP in the UK, that we could see quite clearly that what they were doing was leading to straight out violence. And our community and our organisation definitely was raising that with government. Yeah, um, so you only have to look over to the States to see what's, what's happening with Trump, how he has a massive amount of support with white working class people, even though economically he has next to nothing in common with them, and how that inequality helps to fuel folks like Trump to take that blame of why inequality is happening, in this case in America, and then place that, place that blame on refugees, or in the case of uh, America, on, on migrants coming from Mexico, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, what happened on, on March 15th is, a, is an example of that importing it itself via social media and hiding down in Christchurch. Um, when, I, when I talk to folks, we, there, you know, there are these moments of solidarity, Muslims going up to Ihu Matau and supporting them, uh, Māori supporting uh, folks down at, the, down at the mosque, down in, down in Christchurch. But there is, one of the other things we talked about is how, does, how do these events happen? How do, how do people not realise that there is a white supremacist terrorist hiding in Christchurch? Well, not even hiding, he's just actually walking around. And why does the state always target and focus on particular people as well? And um, one, one of the things I think the reason is, is that there is a very strong A history in New Zealand. Um, people don't know about the history of the place that they, that they stand in. Um, and that's true of activists as well. I've been to a number of um, activist gatherings where they can tell you all about the Bolshevik revolution in 1917 and communism and all this stuff that happened in all these different different countries, but when you ask them about the Battle of Rua Pekka Pekka or, or Rako or what happened recently up at Takaparafa or, or you know, all, these, um, uh, all these different places which are very important to people in, in our own country, they don't know about it. So there's no awareness. So it becomes very difficult to actually have a conversation with someone which requires this historical knowledge of what happened in terms of colonisation and the impact of colonisation and why folks will have to leave their, their homes because of war happening in those homes and the history of why um, those wars happened overseas and then try to get them to understand people that don't look like them or sound like them or have different cultural values. And I think we had a perfect example um, here, in the, here in the Manawatu. I mean, I, I, I watched this guy. He Hands up if you heard of what, this event. Well, kia ora to you. Um, I, I watched a couple of interviews with him and he had no idea that it would be incredibly offensive to chop off the, the uri of a, of, a Māori, of a Māori carving. He had no idea, he was completely mystified. And um, uh, probably a number of reasons. Um, when I was at high school, uh, when I was at Kura and even in primary school, we did not learn about the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, we did not learn about land wars. There was this massive gap of knowledge. Um, I learned about Canada, of all places. I had to draw the map of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and so on and so forth. We didn't learn that there were First Nations people there, but I can still now draw, uh, draw Lake Superior. Um, but it's just this history which is so deeply co disconnected with uh, our, own, our own place, where you would learn about the kings and queens of England, but we wouldn't learn about the Kingitanga movement here in Aotearoa. Um, and you can see that even with some of the rhetoric around like Anzac Day, we could talk about World War I, but we can't talk about the land wars that just happened 40 to 50 years before, before um, World War I. 
So there is all of this kind of stuff underpinning um, New Zealand society that we need to unpick and understand so that we can actually have a proper conversation. That was a common theme when I talked to lots of folks. Um, is there another video? Yeah, ah, yes. And, um, and also, how do, you, how do we f uh, find connections and build connections with different folks that are coming over, over to Aotearoa, like refugee communities? Um, when I've spoken to different folks, they were like, wow, we'd love to learn about, learn about Māori and learn about the history. And it's these things, I think, which build deeper connections between communities. And Guli here talks a little bit about that. Enough is that um, there seems to be a miseducation about the theory of writing and how to fly shark, and also within ethnic communities as well. Um, you know, there's this misconception that the treaty is not for us, it's just about Māori and Pākehā, when actually the treaty is between Tangipanewa and the settlers. So, by extension, we are the settlers because we are not indigenous to these lands. Um, and I think, you know, growing up, those opportunities to build positive relationships between Tangata Inua and refugees were not really yeah. um, set up, you know, and I feel like um, that's something that we could have, if, you know, if we could go back in time, that I feel like should have actually been addressed in terms of ensuring that, you know, there's a solid relationship there from the get-go, um, so that we could all, I guess, unite together on our commonness, because there is a lot of commonality between our cultures, but also our struggles. Um, and it's obviously not on the same scale, you know, I think what indigenous people are going through in their own land is just, um, I don't think it compares to anything. Um, but, you know, there is definitely some similarities there in where solidarity can be strengthened for sure. And I just feel like growing up, those relationships when harnessed at a sort of early stage. Uh, yeah, so highlighting that point. Um, this is one of my favourite cartoonists, Sharon Murdoch. Um, I, another one of the things uh, when I've talked to different communities, when we talk about how do we build solidarity with each other, of course learning at each other's histories, understanding that when we build solidarity across uh, gender, culture and, and sexualities and, and all that kind of thing, it's about respecting and finding space to actually have those very strong conversations. Um, but then another one of the conversations that we've had is how do we identify allies within Pākehā society? Um, how do we build connections once we are solid with each other, with other folks? And um, for me, one of, the th one of the things that came out, one of the many things that came out after the, 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 the tragic events down in Christchurch um, was a stuff, oh no, sorry, RNZ did this, did this uh, research on how much uh, investigation was done on white supremacists and so they went through the documents of the SIS and the GCSB turns out zero there was zero investigations into white supremacists but there was a lot of Maoris a lot of uh, Muslims and and for me it started to pick up where our actual allies are as well there are a lot of environmentalists and there are a lot of peace activists and so uh, I think that highlighted for a number of us the types of folks who would tend to support uh, and to actually dig a lot deeper into the issues impacting uh, marginalised communities here in Aotearoa as well. Um, I've been going to land occupations on and off for about 20 years and organising stuff for a number of years and when certain crowds show up I'm not surprised. So when the Quakers show up I'm not surprised or the, or the Baha'is or the trade unionists or the Greenies or or the peace activists when they when they show up, um, I have never seen a group of bankers show up to <laughs> show up to a Maori land occupation, or uh, never seen uh, an au pair of oil executives show up to show solidarity with uh, with uh, marginalised people. Um, uh, yet to see the banner of the Federated Farmers uh, show up at a peace ex uh, at a peace action or so on and so forth. Um, so for me, it's understanding that there are connections that we need to build with each other as PAC communities, uh, but there's also people out there who regularly show up, and those are the, those are the allies that we also need to be thinking about building bridges with. Apologies.
apologies to any bankers in the room. <laughs> it, it could happen, I don't know. People are diverse. Um, yeah, sort of banging, the, banging on that same drum. This is from last year when MB had been hiring Thompson and Clark to spy on Greenpeace. So, um, uh, uh, refugees and Maldives and Muslims get to get spied on because that's our ethnicity. Um, but if you're a, you're a Pākehā, you have to be an environmentalist or a trade unionist or a peace activist. So, bad luck, Andy. <laughs> um, where to next? Um, so, yeah, I, I would be interested to take a bunch of questions now about some of the points that I've raised. And, um, yeah, that's where we'll step to next. I was just, oh, anyway, it's not working. Um, just so that I could add my voice, because as their customer, um, they should know that I'm not happy about what they're doing. So some bankers might be there. Some bankers might be there, yes. Maybe they're environmental bankers? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe if they're bankers that are involved in environmental uh, issues or peace issues or in trade unions, we can put them into that category. Yeah. Okay, um, other questions? There's two mics roaming around. I think Carl here had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Kia ora. Um, you know I'm making the ACA uh, question. Um, I'm going to throw a little curveball at the start here. Um, I've seen... I'll see if I can catch it. <laughs> How do we, yeah, so I see a growing xenophobia in the so sovereignty movement. So how do we tackle that, um, particularly in this day and age of them us and them, um, us versus them kind of, yeah, it, it's just really sad to see a, a yeah. growing xenophobia in the sovereignty movement. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's, that's, I have seen that as well, which is why in those first couple of slides I talked about um, ensuring that our identity as Tangata Whenua, as, as Māori, as Pacifica, is not actually contained within the constraints of the, of the state. And so when, you know, when I talk to a lot of Māori, some Māori, they go, oh, well, immigrants will take my job, blah, blah, blah. And I says, bro, what about the two people there who got the $1.3 billion and $1.3 billion got taken off the poor people? What about them? Uh, it's just a convenient excuse to blame poor brown people, basically. And they use that to actually start this divided rule amongst us. And so I challenge them. I challenge them on this uh, notion of what is actually a, a, a Māori, if they're Māori, uh, what, what this notion of a Māori worldview is. You know, where is that geographically spaced? If it's just North Island South Island, for me, that's not good enough because our whakapapa is, is, is beyond the confines of the state of New Zealand. And then I get silence. But at least there's some um, more onto the than me that want to debate me. Fine. <laughs> so Here you go. I, I get the impression that this is not just a New Zealand thing, but is a uh, a pattern that we see in in all basically in all colonies. So. The question is, how, how, do you, how do you change that group though? How do you actually get people to learn about their own history instead of just learning about a history that's handed to them on a plate by people who benefited from the distortion of those histories? Yeah, pr probably a couple of things. Um, uh, one, one of the things I, I, I've noticed um, 
is like, like for example, in this very room, I've come to interfaith events where it's it's the Baha'is, the Muslims, the Jewish community, the Christian community, all talking about the different aspects that they have in common and connections and and how they could work mutually on different projects together and, and so on and so forth. That doesn't get on the media, but um, right-wing fundamentalist Christian homophobes on motorcycles gets on the media. So we actually have to understand the, the, the role of the media in all this. Certain things get a lot of engagement and get amplified a lot and other things which are more meaningful and more connected don't make the media as much. And so I would encourage people to look beyond beyond the media. Not 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 easy to do because we're bombarded with it twenty four seven. But it's stepping away and then trying to find those connections with people. Like like for me I see there's the way the way that I see that dynamic playing out is often there is always this call for unity um, from that side and from this side as well. But, and for me, there are two types of unity. So there's unity and sameness where you, we are asked to unify it, but you must do it this way. You must be completely like this. And if you are, if you are like this, then you must give that up, you know, and be like this. But unity and diversity, I think, is a more powerful thing. It's more meaningful because you accept people for who they are and where, they, where they're from or their different beliefs and then you try to build understanding between your, your different, different groups, whether that's as religions or culture or language or gender, sexuality, so on and so forth. It's a more difficult process, but it's a more rewarding process because we start to see the commonality that we all have with each other.